Welcome, everybody. We have a really exciting lineup of speakers today. So, um, and each of them are going to be addressing different aspects and solutions of um, an industrialized retrofit process. And just a quick reminder that, as usual, we're going to have our Q and A session after our final speaker. So please pose your questions in the chat, and we'll get them in the order that they come in. And now to get us started, we'll have a word from James Ortega, Certification Manager at FIAS. Thanks, Mary. Hi, everybody. Hope everyone's having a good, good evening so far. Um, yeah, my, my update is just kind of reiterating what Kim said, that we do have the second day of our Retrofit Summit tomorrow. So if you uh, would like to attend, I think there's a link to it in the chat. And uh, yeah, it's going to basically be a preview of what FIASA's next retrofit standard is going to look like. Um, it'll be a conversation with um, FIASA's um, uh, senior scientist, Graham Wright, and one of my colleagues, Al Mitchell, who's on the certification staff with me at FIAS. Um, And yeah, it should be a good time. It is, um, like Kim said, 5, 5 p.m. Eastern time is when it starts, and it should wrap up around 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, it'll be worth some AA credits as well as CEUs if you're a CDHC. And uh, yeah, thanks, Mary and Kim, for letting me come on. And I'm looking forward to seeing some good questions and a conversation come from all the all the really good speakers that are lined up. Back to you, Mary. Okay, well, first up, we have Lucas Toffoli. Lucas is a principal in RMI's carbon-free buildings practice. He co-leads RMI's Realize Initiative and he leads the Advanced Building Construction Collaborative. The ABC Collaborative works to accelerate the scaling and adoption of advanced building construction technologies in order to achieve energy efficient building decarbonization. And that's a really short summary of a large and ambitious program. And we're gonna to get to hear some insights into the program's objectives and accomplishments so far. So welcome, Lucas. Thanks so much, Mary, uh, for the introduction. And thanks, Mary, Kim, James, and everyone at PS uh, and PHA for uh, inviting me and, and the rest of the panelists here today. Really excited to be here. Uh, as Mary said, I'm going to be talking uh, a bit about um, the ABC Collaborative, but also more generally about advanced building construction and what that means to us, what that might look like, what the different pieces look like, and basically setting the stage for uh, the other panelists who are gonna be then talking about their work on um, particular aspects of industrialized retrofits. So our kind of hypothesis at the ABC Collaborative, and this is shared by the ABC folks over at Department of Energy and many others in our network, is that by modernizing construction practices and using uh, more comprehensive definitions of value, not just things like energy savings and first costs, we can accelerate the deployment of holistic decarbonization strategies, achieving integrative benefits with the speed and scale necessary to meet climate objectives. And those aspects of speed and scale are really central to what we do. Uh, ABC or advanced building construction refers to retrofit and new construction, although today we're focusing on retrofit, uh, solutions that combine um, two main aspects. One is energy efficient building decarbonization. The other is streamlined, scalable, industrialized construction methods. So on the energy efficient de building decarbonization side, these are things familiar to all passive house practitioners. It's not just the utility savings, it's also the maintenance savings, the thermal and acoustic comfort, improved air quality and health, resilience, obviously the reduced emissions, and then at a system level uh, benefits to the electricity system. On the industrialized construction side, the reason why we're focused on that, and we use that as an umbrella term, it's not just uh, you know, panelized construction, for example, but we see a need for higher productivity and faster delivery, um, reduced disruption, increased certainty in schedule and budget, enhanced precision, improved safety. And we really see this as critical to, again, achieving that speed and scale necessary to meet climate objectives. And I'll say a little bit more about some of our research that is highlighting the need and really what that scale is uh, in the US in the residential retrofit market. So what is a whole building decarbonization retrofit and in particular uh, ABC uh, decarbonization retrofit? It combines envelope and equipment upgrades and also some other aspects 
Uh, this is a kind of a quick graphic from some very early uh, feasibility work done by uh, Realize and, and Realize's partners, which is the RMI's Deep Energy Retrofit Accelerator. Um, and just to kind of give you an example, you know, it starts with this idea of automated site capture and digital workflow integration. And Avide will say more about that and her work in that area. Uh, it includes a um, ideally, you know, integrated or in some way streamlined uh, all electric set of mechanical systems. And Tom King will uh, say more about that. Uh, and that it includes um, where the climate calls for it or where resilience uh, requirements call for it. Um, highly insulative, insulative uh, ideally prefabricated wall panels so that you can get um, you know, quick streamlined low disruption delivery. And uh, RMS uh, will say more about that. So the need for retrofits is really um, massive in the US. Um, this, these are some early results from research that we did where we modeled the entire US building stock and modeled a range of uh, retrofit interventions against that building stock. And we found that uh, something like three fifths of the residential building stock at least will require some form of envelope work in addition to electrification to reach effective decarbonization. And those numbers go up if you prioritize resilience as a primary criterion. So our work is, is really cut out for us here. And in some cases, these are uh, lighter touch envelope retrofits. And in some cases, you know, there's a need to go really all the way to passive house level for a number of different reasons. And we're excited to share that research, hopefully in the next month or two, once it gets through the uh, review and revision process. Um, but the short, short takeaway here is that there is really a need for uh, streamlining and um, uh, better, more effective, faster processes for these whole building retrofits. So this is kind of a view of those same results just by state showing that um, you know, while the needs vary by climate, there is a need for whole building retrofits in, um, in, in every state, even if it's a minority in some states, it's a pretty substantial minority like California has a lot of buildings. So you know, a third or, or a, a quarter of the stock there is still a whole lot of buildings. Um, so I'm gonna go quickly through what can an ABC retrofit look like? And I will borrow uh, liberally from, from practitioners in the space. So I, I hope they'll forgive me for that. Uh, this is um, a project that is uh, in process in New York being led by Cycle Architecture and Planning slash Cycle Retro, Retrotech in conjunction with NYCHA and Retrofit New York. And it really shows, you know, kind of this mid-rise um, typology receiving this, this whole building retrofit with all of the different um, uh, pieces coming together and some of those pieces being um, prefabricated like uh, the wall panels, for example. Uh, this is a, a smaller typology uh, from our friends up in Canada, Retrofit Canada. This is the Sundance um, Housing Cooperative. So it's a, a number of different um, townhome style, uh, you know, relatively low rise wood frame buildings that are receiving um, prefabricated wall panels with then the installation blown in behind them and the new cavity that's created there, uh, as well as um, uh, updated mechanicals and, and a range of other work. So this is a, a kind of simpler end of that uh, ABC approach to retrofits on a smaller typology. Uh, this is a um, project that we, we uh, are hoping to start soon that our RMI Realize team in California is leading where we're taking these um, not so attractive, uh, affordable multifamily um, housing developments and turning them into uh, that, what that looks like at the bottom. So uh, more streamlined, more modern and, um, you know, better performance, better comfort and better resilience because frankly, California is seeing its share of extreme weather and power outages as well. Uh, Diving uh, just a little bit deeper here, this is a project that our uh, Realized Massachusetts team and our ABC Collaborative team are working on uh, together closely with our partners there at Onion Flats um, and others in the area. It's a uh, mid-rise affordable multifamily uh, in the Boston area. And uh, we're looking at doing a um, whole building retrofit uh, that includes a prefabricated exter exterior wall assembly, um, there is expected to be factory installed windows there to, to streamline the delivery further. 
a high performance roof, rooftop PV. We also looked at vertical PV in the new uh, facade, but that more likely than not won't be a feature of this particular project. Um, showing you a little bit more about what one of the wall assemblies might look like, although of course this is still to be determined. Um, so high performance wall assembly hung on the existing wall after applying a uh, air vapor barrier and uh, there will be an air gap behind these panels that will allow, allow for running some of the mechanicals there. Uh, we're expecting this project to reach um, uh, FIA certification uh, and to have uh, approximately 92% reduction versus baseline in energy use. So pretty high performance there. Um, finally, I'll close by saying a few words about the ABC Collaborative uh, as an organization before handing it off to my uh, fellow panelists. So we work, um, as Mary uh, uh, said in the introduction, with a wide range of building sector actors, both incumbent and emergent, to accelerate this idea of advanced building construction and retrofits, as well as new construction. And our activities include convening, like our thematic working groups, thought leadership, uh, like the analysis that I showed a preview of earlier, um, some work in workforce and capacity development, because that will be part of the equation as well, innovation scaling to support innovators like Tom and Oramas and Avide, and finally market scaling support where we bring it all together and facilitate projects that hopefully will lead to scalable pipelines. This is a um, incomplete snapshot of our collaborators in the ABC Collaborative. Um, we are growing pretty fast, so hard time keeping up with all the logos. Um, we need to update this slide, but they're, they're all on our website if you're interested. Um, hope you'll uh, keep in touch. Feel free to reach out if you're interested in getting more involved in the collaborative uh, or just learning more about ABC in general. And with that, I will uh, hand it back to uh, Mary and Kim. Thanks again so much for having me. Thanks so much, Lucas, for joining us. And, um, and our next speaker is Tom King. He's a registered architect who is leading TKF, a whole building decarbonization solution provider startup that is based in Syracuse, New York. And TKF is focused on the development of the systems required for affordable and practical whole building renovations of multifamily residences. And he's here today to talk about his mechanical system solutions. So welcome, Tom. Thanks, Mary and Kim and all of those that uh, were instrumental in setting up uh, this call today. Um, I'm really excited to be here, glad to be here. TKF has been operating a little bit under the radar, so it's great to be able to come up for air and share some of our uh, exciting um, new products and development, uh, particularly for um, multifamily decarbonization and renovation. So uh, we're going to talk about three products that TKF has under development and also um, briefly touch on the pilot installations that are slated for each of these products that provide heating, cooling, energy recovery, ventilation, uh, remote control and monitoring capabilities, as well as two of the three products also include domestic hot water production as a single uh, unitized product uh, delivered to the site. <clears throat> um, but first, uh, if, if uh, any on this call like me grew up on uh, Bill Nye the Science Guy, I'd like to uh, give a shout out to a couple of our sponsors. <clears throat> first of all, to um, Architects Pollute. This article is 20 years old. Uh, we're all on this call. Um, it's up to us to start the hard conversations, to have the difficult discussions, to um, not only come up with the solutions, but also implement those solutions. And most importantly, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, talk to your fellow practitioners who are not on this call today, who are not on deep energy retrofits who are still specifying fossil fuel systems, it's up to us to change the paradigm. And um, also brought to you by Evolution. May the best technologies win. <clears throat> this is also a really old article from big conglomerate city GPS. Highly recommend looking into it. Um, also brought to you by 1001 Days in the Life of a Turkey. Surprise, all must good things come to an end eventually, just like those uh, incandescent light bulbs. 
Also surprise, it's easy to track technology, uh, particularly looking at the history of uh, implementation of photovoltaics and how year after year after year after year, these um, emerging technologies are outpacing the predictions in both the industry and the economy and everywhere else. So um, how is this related to whole building deep energy retrofits? Uh, our, our like collective hour, not just TKF's solutions are based in technologies and therefore we can scale our technologies in the same way that um, we have a pathway just like solar PV has taken over the next, over the last 20 years. Um, so that leads us to um, a great graphic by Albert Reiter and Tidman Architects, which essentially leads us to the evolution of the high performance building. I love this graphic. I wish I could meet these guys. If they're on the call, hello. <clears throat> so how is this related to all of, all of what we're talking about here? Uh, we're talking about overlaying the typical adoption curve of new technology in red over uh, what we're looking at as you know the best guess prediction of how to get to a carbon neutral economy. So these two graphs intersect each other on the technology adoption curve and the decarbonization curve. And <clears throat> surprise, um, whole building electrification and deep energy retrofit uh, will become market viable at scale as long as we continue to uh, feed a strong pipeline and um, develop our technologies so that we can see cost reduction at scale as Lucas was suggesting now. <clears throat> Back to our exciting products here is uh, what we're dubbing the Hydropod XL. This is a full service heating, cooling, domestic hot water, energy recovery, ventilation system that can serve up to around four apartment units at one time. Uh, designed to be installed outdoors, a couple shots of our prototype at Syracuse Center of Excellence being tested in uh, our cold and very cold climates in Syracuse, New York. Um, these are slated to be installed on the Retrofit New York pilot project in Phoenix, New York, that has still been um, lumbering along from 2017, believe it or not. It's not dead. Uh, it's about to be alive and running. Installation due Q4 2023. We're delivering 10 of these to 40 apartments. Um, and I wanted to touch on the biggest lesson learned that we've hit on each of our pilot project design processes so far. This one is a big one that we really just, it's probably the most profound lesson uh, thus far, is that by taking all of the mechanical system components um, out of the construction scope, we saved 25% on the cost of the mechanical system. So we're delivering this as an owner furnished appliance. Think about that one for a while. <clears throat> and so obviously, of course, the installation, the distribution, and um, the terminal uh, heating, cooling, and um, ventilation products are all still part of the construction scope uh, by the general contractor, et cetera. Just the TKF Hydropod XL removed from the construction scope to save 25% on the cost of the pod. Uh, our second version is the um, Hydropod LM. <clears throat> and so this product is a smaller version of the XL, of course. And uh, this is a DOE advanced building construction project, phase two, led by Syracuse University. Our pilot installations are for eight of these pods serving a total of 16 apartments. And uh, just a quick uh, architectural concept of how we're looking at distributing the pods and all of the uh, heating, cooling distribution on these buildings. So they're two-story um, graduate level apartments. So it is a full apartment. It essentially is a graduate dormitory. Uh, it is a great representative project of a low rise uh, townhouse type building um, with, a, with small uh, two bedroom apartments. Uh, these products are slated for installation in um, next summer. The biggest um, lesson here is, is obvious, I think, to everyone on this call, but it's really great to point out is that we've got the full team, architects, engineers, product designers, 
um, us, the mechanical system solution provider, the building owner, the Syracuse, you know, Syracuse housing, um, Syracuse University housing, Syracuse construction and planning, everybody's on the team working 100% to figure out what are the problems with installing these types of solutions. And most importantly, what are the innovations that we can come up with so that these types of integrated mechanical products can inter interface uh, with facade panels, with existing buildings, with all sorts of existing conditions. It's been really beneficial. And lastly, we have the CSP or Central System Pod. This one is a, also a DOE Advanced Building Construction Award uh, led by none other, none other than Rocky Mountain Institute. And uh, we're looking at hopefully uh, Q3 or Q4 2025. These products differ vastly from the first two. They're designed to be installed within an existing apartment, uh, do not have domestic hot water included as part of them, and are ideal for big buildings with central plant hydronic heating and domestic hot water already. <clears throat> uh, each of these is one pod per apartment. Big lesson learned on this one is that um, product av availability may change without warning. We had basically the rug ripped out from under us as a whole design team recently, as our OEM supplier is looking to change uh, all of their products off of 410A refrigerant. They basically said, thanks, I'm sorry, we're discontinuing the heat pump that you're working with. Um, so that was a, a really, a tough blow on this product, which we're really excited about bringing this kind of a solution to, again, big buildings with hydronic systems in them. Um, phasing out R410A is going to be, um, it's going to get messy, I think, in this industry over the next couple of years. And we're, since we're on the bleeding edge of product development, we're feeling it right now because we were using an R410A product. Um, the good news is, uh, we're back to the basics. Maybe we'll design it ourselves. Um, at the end of the day, our product will be better because of this. Uh, it's just a huge challenge that we have to overcome right now. Last but not least, of course, if I don't put my salesman hat on, um, I would be remiss, and so would everybody else at TKF at this point. Hey, are you an architect? Are you an engineer? Are you a building owner? Are you a property manager? Is anything that you saw today uh, look like it could be applicable to an upcoming retrofit decarbonization or electrification project, please contact us today. Uh, I'm Tom King, TK at tkfabricate.com. We're actively seeking additional pilot, additional pilot projects um, to prove out our technology and look and understand what we're looking at for um, cost at scale. Thank you very much. Turn it back over to Mary. Thanks so much, Tom. Um... And our next speaker is Oramas Sabulis. Oramas is a serial entrepreneur in innovative construction technology who is committed to achieving high performing, resilient and environmentally sustainable industrialized transformations of our built space. He founded Dextal in 2020 to develop his prefabricated proprietary wall panel solutions designed for efficiently upgrading the structural exteriors of mid and high rise buildings. So take it away, Aramas. Thank you, Mary. Really appreciate the invitation to be a part of this, uh, of this event. And, and, and it's great to see some of the people that I already know from my uh, days back at Intus Windows when I was running this company. So Dextal is an exciting opportunity for not only new construction, but also retrofit project opportunities um, so i'm going to go through some generic slides but then you know uh, i would like to get into sort of the meat and potatoes of, of what we offer uh, and talk about some of the projects that we're currently involved um, so i think this status is pretty pretty evident to to everybody uh, about 40 percent of carbon emissions are contributed to buildings everybody in passive house and uh uh, network knows that, uh, but but more particular when we consider some of the larger cities, uh, more uh, dense populated cities like New York City could be up to 70%. So Dextel's mission essentially is to accelerate decarbonization uh, and, and really do something that can actually leave a dent in, 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 in our carbon uh, emission 
uh, endeavors. Uh, so Dexla is a real solution to a real problem. Uh, you know, when we consider at least new construction uh, products, uh, where our product is 40% better, energy efficient than code requirements, uh, we we can offer product that is uh, 10 to 15 percent lower than traditional on-site construction from the get-go, and so then you know you you can rip additional benefits in terms of faster building enclosure can be about 80 percent faster. And we just uh, actually completed a embodied carbon study, and Dextal's embodied carbon uh, is 43 percent lower uh, if you were to consider. Uh, and compare that to on-site construction practices, especially in the new construction uh, practice. And by the way, Dexel is is the first uh, prefabricated uh, company that is that is currently pursuing FIAS uh, FIAS certification. So we're in the in a, in the midst of the conversation, and because there's no uh, qualified or 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 passive house approved component that that essentially is a unitized prefabricated system so we have to sort of in, invent the new category but but we're working uh hand in hand with uh with vias right now so dexel is essentially a fully vertically integrated mid and high rise exterior prefab solution uh we have a software that we're going to spend a couple uh, minutes talking about that so it starts with the design we have a proprietary software that helps essentially to optimize building exteriors whether it's a new or retrofit construction uh, and then we take that information seamlessly into the fabrication modules we transport directly to the job site and then basically help with uh, installation uh, using our cert uh, third party certified installers so we're, we link the design uh, with the end of the supply chain and the actual constructability of the products uh, so we believe we're relatively unique in that uh, perspective. Uh, just looking at the panel and kind of understanding what what goes into the Excel prefabricated exterior uh, wall panel, uh, we have various cladding options. You know, starts with ACM panel uh, as a rain screen, aluminum. Uh, we have a thin brick option. Uh, we're going to talk. I'll, I'll spend a, a little bit of time talking about the integrated DIPVs. Uh, beyond that, we have a mineral wool insulation that essentially goes into our system, and then we have uh, steel studs, which are perforated, so essentially provides us significantly better thermal values than most of the other uh, assemblies out there in the market space. Um, I wanted to show you a quick study we actually did. Uh, this is the project we're currently working on. We're uh, helping with the design assist uh, map architects out of New York City. It's a 20 some story building in Harlem. Uh, actually, half of the south facing facade, the architect wants to use a solar VIPV system. So, we actually did a, a quick study, and Dextol panels can fully integrate VIPV systems uh, instead, of the, instead of the aluminum cladding or ACM panels. And for this particular area, 7,700 square feet area, the potential savings in addition to uh, in addition to, to this being a prefab system, uh, the energy generated could, could yield about close to twenty thousand dollars annually. Uh, so this is this is a new sort of a trend that we're seeing. Whether it would be for new construction, in particular for retrofit, with with recently introduced IRA uh, potential tax credits, this could actually be a very substantial help for a lot of these mid and high rise building structures. To, to start seeing more of the building integrated PVs on the vertical um, structures. And uh, Lucas has showed uh, a project called Ravenswood in, in Long Island City, New York, that, that Cycle Architect did a lot of pre-construction and design work. Uh, we're actually very much involved in this project and we're uh, one of the considerations for that prefab uh, exterior solution as well. So, you know, we're not going to show the video, but essentially we go through rigorous testing on our panels. You know, I've, I've shared some of the some of the numbers here uh, in terms of like where these panels can go to. And as I mentioned, we're concentrated predominantly on a mid and high rise structure. So as you can see, structural unitized panels can go up to DP 100. Usually the windows are at around DP 
70 window U value, we have an ability to use into Spasso House certified uh, assembly. So we can definitely get to 0 0.14 on the U value. And then the unitized PFAB panel, our value range will range between R17 and R32. So I'm going to get into that just in a second. So we work with very closely with Stephen Winters and Associates. Uh, they ran a heat 3 model, uh, essentially taking the worst condition within the wall and calculating the, the effective R value. Uh, from what I understand, you know, Passive House folks uh, use uh, even Theus or even PHI, I believe, use the same software to evaluate, uh, to evaluate the thermal performance of the building envelope components. Uh, and we can get up to R32 with our entire wall system from based on our uh, understanding most of the passive house structures in mid mid to high rise uh, uh, you know environment will 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 average around r25 so we have a bunch of results that we gener you know generate a number of uh, uh, cases in terms of you know various thicknesses of the panels whether it would be a six inch, eight inch, or 10 inch, but 10 inch panel can essentially yield us um, R32. So we believe it's, you know, uh, even with a, a R25 panel, we can we can definitely target a lot of passive house structures at this point. Um, the big part of Dextel's offering is Dextel Studio, which is an automatic uh, uh, design assist program that basically has uh, is, is driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning to really understand the most, uh, how to de design the most optimal building exteriors as it relates to cost and waste factors. So it's optimized and it provides also complete uh, design reports, including sustainability reports with embodied or operational carbon savings. So what we do is when we work with, with with design firms, and you saw one of the firms that that I showed you, uh, Map Architects, uh, the building in Harlem. Uh, essentially, they provide us the building mass drawings, design intent, uh, and our team uses uh, uses our internal software to basically optimize the entire exterior. Um, and our system reads off all the elevations, whether it would be new construction or whether it would be a retrofit application. We can read off the entire uh, facade and and the system automatically suggests the most optimal panel layout based on our constraints and reduces the waste factor to zero to one percent. Whereas in the uh, regular construction uh, in the field, it's estimated that about thirty percent plus of the materials getting to the job site becomes a construction waste. So it's a massive, massive uh, savings, especially when you start considering embodied carbon footprint. And then we provide the drawings back to the client, essentially with shop drawing level details. And um, uh, this is, I think it's important, uh, the final output, it's a buildable product, right? So once we provide this, this output of renderings and the section details and the shop drawing level details, we can guarantee the price, which is sort of unheard of in our current practices when architects design the buildings and they have to go through multiple val engineering processes because once the GC prices out the job and you start realizing that the job is actually way over budget and, and this process can repeat at least three times on, on an average size project. Uh, whereas in our case, we guarantee the price and we essentially give the, the view for a designer and the owner to the end of the supply chain. So we give them an ability to essentially design a building with the constraints of the supply chain uh, and, and guarantee the price of the earlier design stages. Uh, so it's immediate constructability of a creative design. And, a, and then we seamlessly take that file and bring it to fabrication drawing set, which also cuts down about five months of fabrication drawing set creation. Uh, allowing us to avoid any potential mistakes, uh, transferring the information from design to fabrication floor. Uh, so you can see some of the other things that we can actually generate. Uh, and then we obviously run the local uh, code compliance uh, um, 
characteristics. So I want to talk a little bit about the projects that was uh, presented uh, at the FIAS uh, conference in Chicago last year. So I showed some of those. Uh, so this project right now is already in production. It's a uh, it's a project with LNM Development um, in New York City. It had uh, Empire State Building Challenge Award. Forgot the exact amount, but they were trying to essentially get as close as possible to Passive House uh, or or Passive House inspired. So uh, we were able to hit the targets at uh, the wall that is six inch wall that that we're do uh, we're also will do an interior two inch uh, interior for out wall for for the electrical and and you know we'll have we'll have some insulation there but the overall value now is r24 so you see the building on the left which is the current structure uh what's going to happen is basically they will build an interior uh walls uh two inches off the exterior uh of the exterior while tenants are in place will take down sections of the building from the fifth to 11th floor uh, uh 15 to 20 feet wide sections so we'll take the section down and we'll put our panels up and so we'll kind of move around the building in these uh, 15 20 feet sections and so on the right side you see what the building is going to look like so this is a very unique uh, retrofit project in our case, it's more of a hybrid between retrofit and new construction because the attachment points are going to be similar to new construction. Uh, but essentially, it's a full retrofit got out uh, type of a uh, project where we'll take the walls down all the way down to to the slabs, and that's how we're going to be enclosing this uh, new envelope. Some of the challenges we had, and we still. Uh, sort of dealing with that while we're while we're in the production is you know we we did multiple surveys we scanned the building from the outside we did a physical survey uh, but we also are planning to do about a hundred probes uh, in that building just kind of understand exactly where the slabs are so you know one is we can run the the exterior survey uh, and scan the building in a point cloud but we don't know exactly what's behind that brick. Uh, so that's where the, the probing is going to take place. Uh, very unique project. Uh, it's a high profile project. There's a lot of eyes on us uh, with this one. And if it's successful, it actually opens a lot of doors to these types of retrofits. Uh, while tenants are in place, uh, we can essentially change the building uh, uh, exteriors drastically because a lot of these old buildings are designed in a way that you know have a small openings or 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 the openings that are you know essentially not not providing enough daylight and then once you add the the uh, air conditioning units in it so there, there's no daylight daylight at all um, and so this way we're now opening up the uh the walls and actually providing significantly more daylight here uh this project doesn't look like much, but actually you, you mentioned cycle architecture a few times. So this is uh, with collaboration with cycle architecture. It's a project in Brooklyn. Um, it's a six, five, six story building uh, that basically is relatively new, but in a horrific condition. And what they did is they took down the, the old, I forgot what, I think it was a brick uh, on the exterior. So they took that down. They uh, waterproofed it before uh, the winter last year, and this year we're going to actually bring in panels uh, and we'll overclad over that existing structure. So it's a very different type of a retrofit project compared to the previous one that I just showed you. Uh, the walls stay in place, so no exterior walls are being demolished. Uh, so in this particular case, we will run a, a point cloud uh, survey kind of to understand exactly the locations of every window of all the other corners and, and other conditions within the building. You can see we have some balconies, so some balconies will have to be removed. We have some um, uh, light fixtures, we have some cameras, so those will have to be removed and reinstalled after the, the panels go into play, uh, in place. Uh, this job is actually in the shop drawing stage currently, and we expect to deliver the first set of panels, hopefully end of September, October. 
So it's a unique project that will essentially show um, our ability to to enclose the building with 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 prefab panels. Our prefab panels are R19, assuming there is some R value to the existing walls. I'm sure we're going to hit uh, close to R25 ish uh, after all things are done, and basically the windows will match our windows will match the openings of the existing uh, window openings and once the panels are installed the existing window openings are going to be removed from the inside with a minimal tenant disturbance and so that's why Dexel solution is very attractive to a lot of these minute high-rise affordable housing projects because it, it really provides the minimal tenant uh, uh, disturbance because we don't have to sequence the 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 work inside of apartments with how we're you know building up or how we're installing our panels so once the panels are installed the workers can can selectively go to to various apartments and essentially just remove the existing windows uh and then bridge the gap between uh the old opening and the new window uh, some of the some of the interesting facts here that every floors because it's in new york city every floor will have to be fireproof uh, and every window opening will have to be uh, fireproof as well so much more in a way much more complicated project here um, than than the previously shown one because we have to deal with uh existing conditions and existing corners and existing you know piping and and, and so forth uh, so and you have also some balcony doors uh here um, we have some other retrofit projects that we're currently working on, but I just want to kind of run you through some uh, new construction stuff uh, within the next uh, minute or so. One interesting fact that that we've noticed is we did a project in Queens, and I believe one of the images are on your flyer. So in this particular job, actually, we came in uh, at the lesser cost uh, compared to traditional built uh, uh, on-site exteriors. So you can see the traditional uh, process would have costed them uh, 1.8 million. We came in at close to 1.6. So it's about $200,000 savings. We actually were able to reduce uh, the job site labor from 47 dealing with building exteriors to six. Uh, overall, we were able to reduce the construction timelines from 20 months to 17 months, which led to additional savings on carry costs and the construction loans, especially now the interest rates are higher. That number is actually having significantly more impact. So it's another $280,000 savings. And then added revenue because they were able to start renting these apartments faster. So overall, you know, we were able to reduce an effective price for building exteriors close to 57%, which is a tremendous story. And we, we, we keep telling that story to a lot of our clients. You know, in addition to all of that, this was R24 wall. And, uh, and, and as I mentioned before, we ran a uh, embodied carbon study uh, and comparing our system compared to on-site construction practices. And it's about 43% savings or reduction on uh, embodied carbon. Uh, this is some other projects, uh, again, project in Queens. And this project, by the way, the unique part about this one is we were able to wrap up the building exteriors in six weeks uh, with taking about one week off for holidays. So the ability to wrap building exterior is just, is just significantly faster. We can do about 2,000 square feet a day of fully enclosed building envelope. Similar practices very much with, with uh, retrofit, that probably what takes longer with the retrofit is just actually probing the existing structure and adding the anchors in a proper locations. Uh, and and that's probably takes the longest, but once the anchors are in place to cover the building up is, is, is very, very fast process. So some other projects, so you, you know, you'll see more, more stuff we have, Currently, we're currently working on about 15 projects uh, that that were at the various stages from early design to to, to essentially going and shop drawings and fabrication. Um, this is going to be a very cool, unique project in uh, Newark, New Jersey. So that's it. Uh, I'm open to any questions you may have, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer this via chat or uh, after this presentation. But 
uh, thrilled to be here and thanks again for having me. Well, thanks so much, Aramas, for joining us. And our final speaker is Dr. Avade Zakor, who is the founder of Signatron, a technology company based in Berkeley, California, whose mission is to develop advanced hardware and software solutions in the areas of building energy efficiency and renewable energy. She is joining us to discuss her solutions for streamlined BIM CAD CAM conversions for panel manufacturing. Welcome, Avade. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to this. Um, I apologize for uh, not having the camera working on my laptop. I'm actually giving this talk from my car in a lap with a laptop connected to my cell phone as a hotspot. Um, so um, Signatron has been working on um, the software workflow that's needed for panelizing existing buildings um, for the last two to three years through various uh, Department of Energy uh, ABC projects, advanced building construction projects. Um, our ultimate goal is to develop a fast, accurate workflow for panelization, primarily for low-rise uh, multifamily buildings. So uh, what I'm going to do quickly um, is give an overview of what our, our software workflow is like, and then get into the details step-by-step. Step. Uh, so we start with a um, point cloud of the building that's going to be retrofit as input to our software. Um, and if there's parts of that building that the architects or the uh, contractors want to demolish um, uh, for, for before the paneling happens, uh, we our software allows you to do that in, in, in software. Um, uh, next, we create uh, two things, the dimensionally accurate wireframe models for the building, uh, including the fenestrations such as windows and doors, as well as deviation maps. Uh, uh, in doing so, uh, in addition to give, creating the uh, models of the, the facades, we also delineate the windows and doors uh, accurately. Uh, and finally, we panelize uh, the, the existing wireframe model in an automatic fashion. Uh, and we've tested it in a number of buildings, which I'll go over in, in the next slides. Uh, so this slide shows uh, um, the very first step with uh, point cloud. Uh, on, on the left, you see the point cloud for a building, uh, a two-story multifamily residential building in Southern California, which we refer to as Corona. Uh, the other one is um, uh, a, a Central California building um, uh, in um, and currently we're working on uh, mid-rise buildings uh, in Syracuse and Cambridge, Mass. So at a quick glance, this is kind of like the high level uh, block diagram of our, of our software. Uh, we start with the point cloud and, on the left and we come up with polygonal or wireframe representation. Um, up, we can pass that to panel fabricators or optionally, um, we can pass it to a panel layout and provide the shop drawings to panel fabricators. More importantly, we create what's called the deviation map that allows panel installers to know the warp or the unevenness of the facade so that they can accommodate that during the, during the installation mm -hmm. process in planning the installation process. We believe that's a crucial piece of information that if you know ahead of time can save quite a bit on the actual um, installation time. Uh, so just to reiterate, the data products we produce is a wireframe CAD model. It's either in DWG or DXF, uh, and you can open it with AutoCAD. Um, but the first question you might be asking is, well, how is that different if, if you're just going to use existing software such as Revit to create um, these models? And the answer is, um, most existing buildings in need of this kind of retrofits um, do not have facades that are vertical, do not have facades that are planar. The, the facades are warped, they're non-Manhattan, non-plumb, non-true. And so to accommodate those, we pair this, this CAD model with, with deviation maps that captures all of those non-idealities. So here's an example of a deviation map for, for, for the Corona building I just showed you. So on the right-hand side, there's a scale uh, that shows the deviation from planarity. Dark blue means zero deviation and red means you have, you have kind of like a bump or, or unevenness. And you can do that for every facade of the building. In this case, I'm showing it for the four facades of that particular building. So how, is, how does the Signatron software get inserted into the design workflow? 
Um, I won't go in, into the details of this slide so much. On the left is the workflow for business as usual, and on the right is when Signatron workflow has been inserted. Uh, the, the red boxes on the left have been eliminated. You can see a line through them on the right. And so basically, um, because architects um, are used to and have been using tools such as Revit to do things like construction details, finishes, panel details, or uh, or even demo demolition plans, we we will we will have on the, on the left side of this branch here where my mouse is, uh, we will have architects continue dealing with Revit-like models. And as you can see, there's a bunch of arrows back and forth between the Signatron um, um, software and and Revit. So, for example, the, the architect will put provide the demolition plans to us and we take those into consideration when we do the wireframe model generation. We create panels, we pass that to the architects. The architect might wanna um, uh, manually uh, adjust the aesthetics of the paneling that we did. Uh, they pass that back to us. Um, and once, once the panels have been finalized then the architects can add finishes and details to it. So that's an arrow coming back. And then finally, um, the, um, uh, at the end of the day, we pass the panel schedule uh, to the fabricator shop drawing, which will have the accuracy as guaranteed by Signatron, and then also detail as introduced to by, by Revit. So in a way you can have best of both worlds. You can have accuracy on, on, on this blocks and you can have the niceness and the easy to use Revit features on here. So just to dive into some of these details a little bit more, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, demolition. So he here's the architect intent in terms of what, what needs to get demolished for this particular building. They put an X over this AC saying, hey, this is gonna be gone. And they put a check mark on, on top of these vents and pipes indicating that they are going to stay. And so when we create deviation maps, which is shown up here for, for the roof, for example, uh, we don't. We put an X, which is the same as don't care uh, for for the AC portions. And however, for the vents which are going to be there, we need to um, first locate them very precisely in our in our deviation maps. But also the dimensions have to be very precise. And so this is what's shown with with my mouse is. Moving on to the paneling. Um, so we had quite a bit of um, uh, thinking about which kind of how, how do we want to make our software be agnostic to the panel manufacturers? Uh, it, it, we can't really, every panel manufacturer has their own kind of set of constraints and rules and details. So we had to come up with the least common denominator that can be applied to a variety of different manufacturers. So to this end, we came up with three different methods for paneling. Uh, okay. Case one, which is shown on the upper left, is where the window seams are uh, aligned with the panel, are allowed to be aligned with the with the panel scenes. So these, these two green objects are windows and the red lines are panel scenes. Uh, case two, which is the seems to be the most common case, is where, where the windows are enclosed by, by panels. And case three, with some manufacturers, the panel scenes go right through the middle of the window, as you're seeing. And so this is kind of like the user interface, if you will, for our, for a paneling code. Um, the user specified minimum and maximum width and height of panels, uh, as well as the window to panel tolerance. And why with do specified, um, you hit the return button and in a matter of seconds, our software comes up with um, panel layouts, such as the one that you're seeing, that you see here. Uh, and th this is, these are the, um, three facades of the building we were talking about. The red line is the is the support line where the panels are gonna be hung from and the green boundaries are, are the panelization. So the objective in our panel paneling code is to minimize the total number of panels as, so as to minimize the heat transfer. There's other constraints we can add, for example, minimize the number of vertical um, uh, junctions and, and other, other, other desirable properties. Uh, so you can play all kinds of what if games. So if, you, if I pick the maximum height and width of my panel parameter to be eight feet, uh, I get 31 panels like it's shown here. If I pick it to be um, 16 feet, I get only 13 panels like, like it's shown here. And, and these two designs um, might look similar, but uh, if, you, if you look deep down inside this red um, curve here, you see a lot, there, there are a lot more panels here on, on upstairs than there are down here. So you have a knob that you can adjust by setting the minimum and maximum panel widths in order to uh, come up with different uh, paneling scheme very quickly. 
We've also done some accuracy studies. Um, uh, so basically to convince panel manufacturers who are very much um, still believers in tape measures and handheld measurements, we, we went to this Corona building and we measured what we call incremental measurements, which is distance between features, like distance between the doors and windows or the length of the window or distance between the edge of the facade and the beginning of a door. Uh, and, and then we also did what we call overall nested measurements, which is shown down here, which we start with the left side of the facade and you keep measuring to the beginning of the first window, then to the end of the first window, then to the beginning of the second window. So it's, 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 it's a series of nested measurement that it's shown here. And then what we did is we had the same, the same uh, professional service people who had created the laser scan and the Revit, uh, they, they created the Revit model using the point cloud. Um, and we also, um, so we used the hand measurements essentially as the ground truth and we compared the error, error in double quotes, meaning the delta between the Revit model as well as our, the model created by Signatron software and these two tables show those. So on, on the top, the table on top shows for, for, the, for the, what we call the incremental uh, dimensions, the distance between features. And the thing to, to notice is that the east and west facades, which have the most number of windows, the um, average um, signatron, I think I have to hit that, yeah. The, the average uh, error for a signatron is about half of what you'd get in error. The units of these are in feet. And of course, the maximum error is almost half of what you get with with um, with Revit. Um, and furthermore, if and this is uh, the same thing, the same story holds true for for the what we call the nested measurements or the overall measurements. Uh, so the average error is one third um, of what you get in Revit. Um, and 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 so there's there's quite a bit of improvement over uh, business as usual um, methods. Um, or creating these dimensionally accurate models. Um, this is the last slide. Uh, in terms of timing, our software is fairly automated. Um, um, it, it's quite a bit faster than Revit and quite a bit faster than AutoCAD uh, even. Um, so for, for the examples I showed, there's two hours of what I call automated processing where you hit the return button on your computer, go have lunch, dinner, whatever, come back two hours later, it's done. Uh, and then, um, and then you spend about two minutes per window to to kind of like delineate the windows. And and for this example building that I showed, it took about two and a half hours of human interaction to to create the shop drawings from the point cloud. Um, currently, we're looking to work with um, panel retrofit projects in addition to the ones that we're working on in in Syracuse, New York, and and Boston, Mass. Um, and if you're interested in talking to me, feel free to contact me at, at the email uh, link below. Thanks so much, Avade, and thanks to all of our speakers today. Um, we've got some great questions to discuss, but first we're going to pause to thank our sponsors. Hi, I'd like to give a big thank you to the fine organizations that make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible. First, a big shout out to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you, too, to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Glavel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification Units, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. And thank you to our champion sponsors, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, Prosico, and Source 2050. And thank you to our patron sponsors, Aero Aggregates, Brennan Brennan, Brooklyn Solar Works, Euroline Windows, Coltraco Ultrasonics Micro Air Leak Detector, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Owens Corning, RDH Building Science, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and US Engineered Wood T Stud. Thank you, sponsors. We have a few questions here. Um, our speakers have been incredibly thorough, and uh, there's a few less questions than we expected. So uh, if anybody has any questions that they were reluctant to post, please go ahead and do so. Um, but we'll start first up is Billy Tyndall. He wanted to know, uh, this was for Lucas, how do you map the climate map against population centers? 
most people live on the coast and in the Sun Belt, and uh, there's other parts that are not so populous. Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, we did uh, kind of a comprehensive building uh, stock characterization analysis together with some of the national labs and DOE. Um, and then we, we did uh, modeling of different retrofit packages against that. Uh, so in a sense, we've done all of the work for all of the population centers and then um, uh, practitioners and industry and other decision makers can take that information and apply it to you know, where they feel like uh, there is the, the greatest need or where there, where is the greatest priority geography for them. Um, however, in addition to that, uh, in our um, you know, forthcoming uh, uh, market guidance report, we also took uh, that modeling of retro packages um, and uh, did a couple things with it that can help with prioritization. Uh, one is to uh, chart out which typologies based on certain building characteristics like um, you know, building size, single family, attached or detached or multifamily, um, uh, wall construction and some of the systems um, uh, showing how many uh, dwelling units there are within each of those sets of typologies or each of those um, typolo typological categories uh, overall and also um, by state. Uh, in addition to that, we built on some work from a kind of higher level um, uh, market insights report that we published uh, about a year and a half ago um, and, and highlighted some priority states, I think about 10 priority states and um, you know, provided some in, or will provide some information on what are the top uh, typologies within those states. A lot of these data will also be available publicly. So if folks want to uh, kind of dive into the data and um, make their own cuts or make their own filters um, geographically or by typology, that will also be possible. Um, so hopefully all of those things together answer uh, uh, your question or what you're getting at, but um, we're trying to make this as, as useful as possible, um, both recognizing that there are indeed um, geographic you know, centers of population, but also that those parts of the country that are not as densely populated are still going to need um, uh, retrofit solutions and uh, in many cases, industrialized retrofit solutions may actually be an even better fit for those uh, parts of the country because you don't have to um, have as many things available locally on site. Uh, and so we don't want to just say, hey, we're only gonna focus on the big cities. We're trying to provide information, you know, while recognizing that there are certain um, uh, peak areas we wanna provide information that's useful across the whole country. So I hope that answers your question, but uh, if not, feel free to drop any follow-up questions in the chat. Thanks, Lucas. And um, next up is Andrew Gromlich. Good afternoon, all. Um, my question, I believe, was mostly oh, it was, uh, mostly or lightly answered uh, already in the chat. Uh, just my concern, I do a lot of structural design and a problem we're always running into with adding MEP units and uh, well, very few people around here add solar at scale on top of roofs, but even though they should, um, roofs often are under designed, especially for like snow drifts and um, adding PV onto roofs or adding adding any loads onto roofs are often very is often often very difficult, at least in our area. Um, and I was wondering if that was just other areas have it easier or because it seems like roof adding rooftop pv is integral to most of these solutions um except for obviously for the uh wall wall-based vertical solar panels on super high rises but um for anything in like the you know the five-story range rooftop pv seems integral but my experience is that it's difficult and if you could talk about that i'd be grateful sure i'll say a few words and then uh, or Amos may may have some more to say about building integrated PV or or others here. Uh, so you know, adding to what I put in the chat about you know if you if you're 
uh, lucky in a sense to be going from a old ballasted roof to um, a mechanically fastened or adhered roof, uh, you're gonna get quite a bit of um, uh, load savings from removing all that river stone from your roof. Uh, in my experience, in, in most cases, that's more than enough to comfortably accommodate the extra load from even a ballasted uh, solar PV system, which is obviously the type of system that's gonna add uh, the most amount of structural load on the roof. Um, if, if you're not in that situation or if that doesn't give you enough headroom, um, you can do you know, a mechanically fastened solar PV system, which is gonna add less load, but it's obviously more work and you gotta put some, some holes in your roof. Uh, you can also look at a um, vertical PV system, so like a building integrated or facade integrated PV uh, system. Um, you know, we also fi find is that on larger buildings, the PV is comparatively a smaller uh, offset for the overall building load because the ratio of surface area to, to um, uh, the volume of the building or the use of the building is smaller. Uh, so as you get with get to larger buildings, it may be, uh, while it might be a missed opportunity for savings, it may not be quite as integral um, to kind of the overall, you know, decarbonization of the building. And that's especially true in hopefully in the whole country eventually, but especially in those parts of the country that are already moving quickly towards um, lower carbon grids. So if you have a kind of zero carbon aligned or zero carbon ready building that is electrified, that is highly efficient, has controlled loads, even if you don't put on-site PV on it, uh, you're still either achieving or will soon achieve uh, kind of decarbonized, um, you know, building operations there. Uh, and then finally, a lot of larger buildings um, that are not in, in, you know, dense urban areas may have uh, kind of site uh, availability for PV, whether that's um, like solar carports or other underused, utilized areas of land where you can put uh, you know, ground mount um, uh, or site installed uh, non-roof PV. Sandra Lester had a question for Tom and she had to leave, but um, I'm just gonna ask it for her. Uh, Tom, have you tried integrating drain water <laughs> heat recovery into your system or black water heat recovery? Sure, I mean, I've had some experience with those systems. We're not particularly looking at it on our side uh, because I guess primarily the um, the gray or black water does not exit through the pod. So um, I can see where we could increase the domestic cold water inlet temperature. Um, you know, I think there could be some benefit there. Uh, we don't have that in our product line currently. Um, I think there's some option, but I think I, I, my understanding of that type of system is that it's best hooked up maybe directly back to the um, um, proportioning valve, like on a shower or something. So it goes straight back to the shower, the heat recovered water, um, if I'm not mistaken. Next up is James Henshaw. Is there a maximum building size and or ideal project size for Dextal? Or is manufacturing capability able to keep up with pretty much any size building and the associated phasing and speed of a project? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I answered a lot of the questions actually in the chat. So if you, if you, if you want to scroll through it, but yeah, we can handle pretty much any size jobs. You know, in a new construction, we're looking at jobs that are over 30 stories and we can definitely keep up with with the demand and the production of, of all of those. Uh, for the retrofit, we generally target the buildings that are, especially in New York City, that are four stories and up. Um, and the reason for it is predominantly because, uh, you know, we want to we wanna have a little bit larger scale of the products because the first floor or the starter floor and the top floor, which would be the parapet floor, will be a unique size panel. So we want to have at least two to three floors of the panels that are uh, somewhat um, uh, standard. And with, especially in New York City, with the buildings that are five, six stories and lower, you have a fire escapes. Uh, so that really complicates uh, the, the overall overfighting process. So we wanna 
have as clean of a facade as possible uh, that really reduces the amount of work that needs to be done on the existing structures prior to installing the panel. So generally the higher, the, the, the taller the buildings, the cleaner the facades. Okay, and um, this question is also for you um, by Sandra Lester and she had to leave. So I just was wondering, uh, she asked, are you also seeking certification by IFA? I think she meant PHI. Um, or so uh, the, the tricky part with the PHI and FIUS, and I'll disclose to them, there's quite a few people here, but just to understand the difference from the manufacturer side, um, PHI does not agree to our NDA agreement. Uh, so essentially, they would like to disclose every single part and component of our system. Uh, which we're not ready to do that at this point. Uh, FIAS uh, is, is okay signing mutual uh, NDA agreement. So we're currently pursuing the certification with FIAS. So no, no, uh, no preference in a way, uh, you know, of the organization, but in terms of our business model right now, we're not just ready to open up all the intricate parts of our gas cleaning system and like the intricate parts of our system overall. Okay, great. Thanks. And um, I guess our next question is up with Daniel Reris. How thick are the panels and how do you prevent moisture buildup between the original facade and the new panels? Yeah, that's the trickiest question that, that, that I usually get when we talk about the retrofit panels. Uh, our panels are uh, range from six to 10 inches. Uh, somebody asked a question on the building that I showed in the 20. 1240 Bedford in Brooklyn. Uh, we had some, uh, uh, we had one elevation that it was a street facing elevation. So we had to uh, default to four inch, uh, four inch panel because of the encroachment into the public sidewalk. Um, in terms of the, the moisture buildup, the, our answer is the following. Uh, once Dextal panels are installed, we fully enclose the building envelope water and air type, regardless of what the existing structure was, whether it was fully watertight, airtight, or, or it was relatively leaky. Uh, so our vapor barrier was, is on the inside of our panel. And so our panels breathes to the outside. Essentially, we use a sheathing board on the outside that is a vapor permeable, but it's water and air type. So you know, the question is, what would happen if there's a moisture between our panel and existing building structure. So essentially, you know, the, the, the existing building structure allows the building to breathe to the inside. So this could happen. You know, there was a big discussion about this, this topic when, when I did a presentation in uh, Chicago at FIUS conference. The idea is that, you know, we we're, we're, we're really don't think too much about what happens to the pipes when they get enclosed into the building. You assume, you know, they were done uh, and 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 the, the the enclosure was properly done, so not to have any moisture or any leakage in the future. So our building uh, panels are are essentially tested to 15 pounds of water to ensure that there is no water or air potential penetration through the panels. So you know once the envelope is enclosed, then then at that point there shouldn't be any more penetration. Let's see, Dean Freeman. So uh, this was a question about, will this smaller window openings be equipped with mechanicals as well? I think this was for RMS also. Yeah, so actually for, for the project in 1240 uh, Bedford, we were considering, uh, the client was considering to using uh, like a PACA type of a heat pump system that could have been potentially integrated through our walls. Uh, we actually are currently working on standardizing integration of heat pump units within our panel. So to bring in a fully unitized package panel plus the unitized system. But the, the budget constraints uh, essentially shut down this idea and we will end up using just standard IC, ACs within the window units, not ideal. Uh, but but that's what's going to happen. So, you know, the the goal for the future really is to to start integrating more uh, heat pump units uh, within our system that can either be penetrated through the window or through the existing wall. Um, that gets a little bit tricky, and that's and that's where I think 
for us, when we look at these, these older buildings, the challenge is that these window openings are already so small. And then all of a sudden now you want to keep adding more and more mechanical system within that opening. So essentially it, it, it drastically reduces daylight opening altogether. So the previous project that I showed you, there was a question, you know, why they decided to go with, with, with essentially removing the existing facade. It's just the openings were so narrow and there were some wonky horizontal, uh, very narrow windows that they didn't want to do this anyways. They would have kind of you know removed some of the brick and they said well if we're going to start removing some of the brick and block might as well just rip everything out and and basically install um Dexel panels the other consideration is why a lot of clients don't want to deal with the window openings because there might be some hot materials in it so a lot of them they just rather leave it uh and not touch it because that the consequences of that and and you know uh and and essentially uh, removing some of those hot materials, whether it would be asbestos or something like that, is is, is really costly and, and it could delay the project tremendously. Michael had a question also for you, Oramas, about um, what type of anchors for retrofit panels are you using? So uh, we generally use, we have a standardized set of anchors for new construction and retrofit, but uh, I, I think I've answered that in the in the chat as well. We're used to modifying some of the anchors based on the building conditions. You know, even for new construction, sometimes uh, when we go through engineering approval process, uh, some of the state licensed engineers would like us to slightly beef up the, the anchors for the structural load. So we don't have issues doing that. So this is the part where we are very comfortable uh, redesigning and adjusting based on the building conditions. Okay, great. And um, this next one was asked by Michael Eliason, and I think he has left. So I'll go ahead and ask him again, <laughs> or unless you're on the hot spot here. Um, <laughs> is there flexibility on the window material and design? Uh, and so definitely, definitely on the that, but uh, yes, yeah, so definitely on the window design, there's a lot of flexibility. So, you know, any typical window design, you know, operable fixed uh, now, especially in New York City and some other markets, uh, the bird friendly glass is being required. So we have those options, double pane, triple pane. Uh, we currently use Intos uh, windows that can can go to, to very high tall buildings and, and also to very high performance buildings like the passing house type of uh, structures. We have an ability to source an aluminum window uh, option uh, should there be a need for that as well. Bernard Farrington had a question. Yep. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's partially been answered, but I'm pretty curious about the, the larger prefab panels and how they get presented to a, an existing facade and what is done to account for the deviations in, in you know, the existing facade to have that connect properly. You know, are they putting on full rail systems and getting them all flush first? And I don't know. What is it? Yeah, so uh, our panels, uh, we don't do the mega panels. So our panels, uh, the width, maximum width is seven and a half feet. We'll do, you know, floor to floor height, whatever the floor height is, you know, whether it's nine, 10, 12, in, uh, 12 feet. Um, in terms of adapting to the existing building condition, so that's that's probably the trickiest part for the retrofits. One is, is you know, the proper scan has to be done. So I have a day touch the on a lot of that so we do point cloud as well you know we then convert that to revit we try to figure out you know uh, some of the building deviations and then attachment of the anchor points is the crucial part right uh some some old buildings might have bellies so you know the facade might bow a little bit so you have to account for that some of the windows might be slightly crooked so they're not going to be perfectly aligned so that's where I think a lot of intricate parts come in. To hang the panels, to be honest with you, is the easiest part, right? The, it's kind of like building the house or building the building. The foundation is what's the most important. Uh, the rest of this is, is, pretty, is pretty easy to, to build. So it's, it's kind of the same thing. Once your anchors are properly aligned uh, and for the panels to be installed, that's, 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 that's a pretty straightforward process. But yeah, aligning the anchors, ensuring that there's a plumb and square uh, you know, alignment. So whether some of the anchors have to be shimmed, some of the anchors have to go deeper. 
inside that there was also a question, how do we attach the anchors? You know, there's a way to attach the anchor through the brick or a lot of clients actually prefer to remove the brick and attach the anchor directly to a, um, directly to a slab. And then even before attaching it, there has to be a proper probe done of the existing slab to understand the conditions of those slabs uh, and how far, how much of the weight this can bear. Like the project that I showed you, 1240 Bedford, uh, once the analysis of the building facade was done, it was determined that this building facade is going to be crumble, uh, is going to crumble. Uh, so they had to reinforce the existing building facade and we had to distribute our point loads. So our panels have two anchors uh, or two hooks uh, on each side on the top. And so we had to introduce additional uh, hooks in the middle of the panel. So basically distribute the, the load instead of two points to four points uh, based on that uh, condition of that existing facade. So that's where a lot of time is being really spent uh, you know, in, in terms of the design and, and understanding exactly what, what anchoring points uh, needs to be used and how these anchors will have to be attached in order for the facade to, to, to seamlessly okay. go over that. And um, the last one is, it's, 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 it's about four inch gap between the existing facade and the, and the Dexcal panels. So there's yep. enough of that, uh, uh, room to, to, to play around with. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll perhaps maybe if Lucas or Evita could comment on their systems and, and the same issue, quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'll invite uh, Bavade to, to say more about, you know, how they're dealing with this on the ground. And I'll say um, we, we see a number of different systems and, you know, we don't have a, a system that is ours specifically as RMI because we're not a fabricator. Um, but, you know, generally it's it's some combination of having um, that gap behind the panel to give you, you know, flexibility, having some adjustability in the anchors. Um, there's a, a team at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab um, that's doing a, a fair amount of work on, um, you know, basically digitally assisted uh, panel alignment and installation where they're using augmented reality um, to, you know, help uh, installation crews um, understand in real time uh, you know, where where the panel is uh, as it's going in relative to, you know, what the design is supposed to be uh, in terms of, you know, plumb and square and uh, rotation. Um, so we've seen a number of different uh, approaches to that, both in, in the um, kind of design of, of the cross-sectional assembly in the anchor and in the um, kind of installation solutions, uh, all of which is to say that we are, um, you know, ha happy that the designers and practitioners have this um, this challenge top of mind, and are coming up with, you know, pretty innovative solutions to make sure that it gets addressed. And Havide, if if you're still there in in, in your car on your hotspot, uh, I'm <laughs> sure you have more to add on on um, how you're, you know, dealing with that in the uh, workflow integration. Yeah, um, I think you pretty much summarized it nicely. Um, I think there's, uh, I'm aware of two, two pieces of work. One of them, you just mentioned the, the NREL people, uh, sorry, Oak Ridge people that have this augmented reality method of attaching. And then um, others are also thinking of kind of like robustifying, uh, almost think of it as you, if you're editing a polygon in software, and you want to close a polygon, you bring your mouse close to the edge of the of the first vertex, it kind of snaps into the right position. You can kind of think the kind of doing the same thing for panel uh, anchoring is that uh, you, you your panel touches the anchor, but if you're not dead on on the right spot, it's been the anchor has been designed in such a way that it kind of shifts in place automatically without having to do too much precision engineering work. Um, but, but you do need to know uh, the deviation uh, of the building in order to know, A, where you're gonna put your anchors and B, how far off is the anchor in, in, the, in the Z dimension sticking out of, the, out of the building. Those are crucial pieces of information that the panel installers and fabricates need to take into account. James Ortega, did you have 
any questions or comments you want to chime in with? Yeah, I had a couple. I really like the I like the whole concept of the the three D print cloud versus three D scan stuff, and I was hoping that yeah, if the other the other panelists could kind of talk about what our last panelist talked about in terms of you know that whole system just sounds so fascinating to me from a time saving perspective of like going on site rather than having you know a whole crew that has to go out and take measurements depending on the weather. So I was kind of curious what what the rest of the panelists thought about the last presentation, which I, I don't think we got previewed previously. So that was that was kind of my thought was to talk a little bit more about that. If the, if anybody had any extra thoughts. Yeah, I think I think the, the main reason we did those hand measurements was because some of the existing panel manufacturers have traditionally been doing those those hand measurements. And really for them, the proof is in the pudding. It, you know, they wanted to know whether the answers coming out of our wireframe models from our software match up with what they would have done um, traditionally. And for, for and for the two-story small building that I was talking about. Um, that's doable, you know. You can you can have someone climb over to the second floor and do measurements. And just as a point of reference, you know, it cost us nearly three times as much to pay the people who were doing hand measurements to do that, uh, and, and much longer than um, than the actual laser scan. Uh, you know, they sent two guys to the building. They were there nearly ten hours. And uh, they did hand measurements with tape and also hand measurements with disto. And for each modality, they took three measurements of each dimension. And only if two of them were in agreement, they jotted it down. Uh, so one thing that we noticed is that there's actually a delta and difference between tape and disto. So <laughs> there can't even be an agreement on what the hand measurement is. The second thing is that you can't really uh, measure deviation of the from planarity using hand measurements. But nevertheless, um, you know, it's it's encouraging to know that that you know the the precautions we've taken in our software results in more accurate dimensions than than Revit. Uh, some other interesting facts that showed up is that the vertical dimensions are are generally more erroneous than the um, than the horizontal ones. And one reason for that is that um, the the frames of buildings, uh, the frames of windows are sticking out perpendicularly from the facade. And so if you're scanning from from the bottoms, you know, from the street level, uh, those those frames sticking out create a shadow or occlusion artifact. So you don't quite see the point cloud right above the, the the windows. And so that causes errors in the in the vertical dimension more so than in the horizontal dimension. Um, did I answer your question? I'll add, James, since since uh, you know you you kind of asked uh, you know in general what our thoughts were. I mean, I just want to want to echo what Avide said about hand measurements. Is that you know my experience when you're doing field measurements, like I've had to send folks out to the field multiple times because they come back with you know a bunch of numbers on a plan, and then you have a designer. Uh, spend time, you know, putting those into an as built and and they don't line up, uh, and that's a lot of wasted, you know, wasted time. So um, I, I, I commend Avide for doing, um, you know, some of that gut check work and and spending that three x time on the different kinds of hand measurements to validate uh, what they're doing. But um, just want to emphasize that as as Avide's research and you know the the um, similar kind of work that Dextal is doing on, on site capture continues to advance. There's a huge opportunity for, for less time, less money, and more accuracy uh, in these methods. Um, and, and, and more information too, to Avide's point about the Z dimension not being something that you can capture well with manual methods. Yeah, I was. That was exactly my point too. I mean, my job before I started at Fias, I was a, I worked for a small architecture firm, and you know, eighty percent of our work was going to do as built drawings of what was currently existing, and then you know, having to put that through Revit, and it's you know, it's me and two interns. They send us out there for eight hours. You come back and you go, okay, what did you scribble? I don't know. What did you scribble? I'm not sure. We were out there so long. So that was yeah. I was very very fascinated by that entire process. It sounds like way way more accurate because i'm you know that is it's a really hard part of the job and you know you go back into revit and you're expecting everything to be square angles and a lot of times it's not so you just have to deal with what's there 
you know, the number of the times you're just write VIF on the drawings because you're not exactly sure how how actually big it was that room you were in. Um, so yeah, that was that was my biggest takeaway as well. I just wanted to hear if that was similar from from the other two guys. I guess one last point about Revit I want to add is that Revit has really been meant to be used as a design tool. When you're designing a brand new building, you want it to be vertical. You want it to be square and plumb and Manhattan and 90 degree and true, all of that. It has The design has to be that. Whereas what we're working on most of the time, if you're retrofitting existing buildings, it's an as-built you're dealing with. And even if you just built a building five minutes ago, by the time you measure it, because it deviates from what, what the Revit design was, it's not any of those. So um, so that's uh, so, so even if you have a point cloud, you just have to have the right software tools to extract the, the correct information from it uh, and resist it. When you, when you work with Revit, there's an in, incredible temptation to make everything square and 90 degree, and which these buildings are not. Avade, I found it interesting that you're focusing on the smaller buildings because, as Oromus said, there's often so many complications on the smaller buildings. I mean, just all sorts of pipes coming out, vents coming out, uh, wires to get around. I mean, that's an added complication on those size buildings. Right, right. Um, I think the mid-sized buildings have their own challenges, and we are in, in the process of phase two of ABC project. We are addressing some nine-story and six-story buildings. Uh, the challenge for those is that, again, traditional laser scanning, um, the density of the points on the point cloud becomes less and less as you go higher up in the building. Um, and so you might have to scan from both top and bottom in which case then you have really good density on top and bottom, but not so good in the middle. Um, you have to deal with this shadowing artifact. So they, they both have their own kind of set of challenges. And so we're, we're kind of now testing ourselves, going through the same rigorous hand measurement type of a process with, with mid-sized buildings to see where the holes are and where the inaccuracies are coming from. One of the biggest sources of inaccuracy we found before was that, um, even if you have a human in the loop delineating the windows and fenestrations, the color of the window frames and the, and the background stucco is so similar, you can be squinting at it for an hour and not know where the boundary of the window is. Uh, so, so for that, we've developed kind of like geometric tools to allow you to automate, to guide the user to figure out where, where those boundaries are so that when you bring the panel on site, it fits properly. Great. And um, Lucas, before we leave, I just thought it might be helpful to, um, if you could talk a little bit more about uh, kind of upcoming opportunities or where people might get more information on that, because I know on your website, there's a lot of information about um, grant applications, funding opportunities, and other opportunities for uh, anybody who's on the event today who might be looking for that information. Yeah, absolutely. So um, encourage folks to visit our website. I just dropped the link in the chat. It's advancedbuildingconstruction.org. So it's fairly easy to remember. Uh, we try to be you know, pretty good about posting um, funding opportunities and support opportunities on the website, as well as things like industry news and reports. Uh, we also um, highlight uh, the, the kind of most relevant ones um, on a bi-monthly basis in our newsletter. And so if you, you know, send us a message through the contact page in our uh, website, you'll also get added to our newsletter. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's um, a, a good kind of uh, font of information. And then if you're interested in getting um, uh, involved in kind of a more participatory way, please feel free to reach out either to me directly or through our website. We'd be happy to have folks um, join the collaborative who are, you know, part of organizations that are uh, mission aligned with um, with advanced building construction. You know, it's it's a big tent, and um, at least for you know for the moment, it's 
um, very much open. We're lucky to have some DOE support uh, during this initial period of the collaborative. So, you know, there's no cost to join and that allows you to participate in our thematic working groups, which have, uh, we have five of those right now on integrated systems and manufacturing, embodied carbon, uh, codes and standards, workforce and finance and risk management. So we have um, sessions of those different working groups uh, from time to time, including some uh, coming up uh, in, in the next couple of months. Um, and uh, those are, you know, open to to our members uh, mainly. But again, it's it's a pretty light lift to become part of the collaborative. So I encourage folks to take a look at that and uh, feel free to reach out if you're interested again in getting involved. A lot of folks on the call uh, today are already uh, involved and um, hopefully, you know, getting something uh, out of that uh, participation. Happy to also answer any more questions about you know, what we do or, or um, uh, what it means to be involved either on the call here or in follow-up calls with uh, interested folks. Great, thanks. And um, James, do you want to talk about just for anybody who missed it a little bit more about what's going to happen tomorrow? Sure, thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, so tomorrow is the uh, second and last day of Theus's Retrofit Summit. Uh, which is another kind of vertical webinar like this one is. Um, same time period as this one is as well, 4 to 6 p.m. Central Time or 5 to 7 Eastern. Um, we're going to be hearing from Theus's um, senior scientist, Graham Wright, and my other coworker, Al Mitchell. They're going to be talking about the next iteration of Theus's retrofit standard. Um, and be a good discussion, lots of uh, Lots of new ideas that we're going to be presenting tomorrow um, that Graham's been working on with Al. So if you can make it, please try to. Um, and uh, yeah, my colleague Jenny just threw the uh, threw the link for registration into the into the chat. And we do have um, we do have it will be recorded. So if you can't make it live, you can always watch the recording later. Um, and we hope to see you there. Well, thanks everybody. I really appreciate everybody's time. It's great to hear from you all and. Uh, I assume there's no further questions, Kim? Nope, that's it. That's all the questions. Thank you all for joining. Um, thanks to the presenters and for FIAS for reaching out to us about collaborating on this event. And um, great to see so many new faces. Have a great evening. <laughs>